I'm Pastor Will Clark. This is Isle of Faith United Methodist Church, and we are joined together today in our virtual worship experience. That sounds kind of funny, right? A virtual worship? Because worship is meant to be something from the heart. So we have to really on our own figure out how can we experience God when we're so far apart? Well, that's easy. Because God and the Holy Spirit has promised to be with us always. So no matter where you are and what you're doing, please set aside some time, rest in the Spirit, and join us together in worship. We may be doing this for a while. We're relying on the information coming from various sources to tell us when it's safe to get back together. Until then, know that we are joined together by the Holy Spirit. And no matter where we are, we're worshiping as a family. Now, this does affect many things, so just keep watching the website. Uh, no activities are going to be at the church until further notice. It may affect Palm Sunday. It may affect Holy Week and even Easter. But it will not cancel it. We will just have to find creative ways to worship together the resurrection of our Lord. And we will. So let's trust in the Spirit. Spend this time together in worship. And I'll see you when we meet again. Let's join together in our call to worship. Once you lived in darkness, now the light of God has shone upon us. Find what is pleasing to God and follow God's ways. The acts of darkness are left behind as we journey to God's light. Thanks be to God who gives us light. Open our eyes and our hearts to receive the light of salvation. Amen. Amen. We're so glad you're here worshiping with us. And it is so good to know that we do not have to be in this building together in order to worship, that wherever you are, that you can lift your voice, that you can pray, that you can sing, that you can shout, that you can dance. But for now, with our circumstances that we're in, I just wanna invite you to be free in the spirit wherever you are, to allow God to speak to you, to give you a new song this morning that you would know how long, how wide, how high and how deep his love is for you. Let's celebrate that this morning.
morning, I just want you to know that God has set us free. And so as you rest in that this morning, I pray that your chains would be broken, that any place of fear, of doubt, of sadness, of guilt, of shame would be broken in the name of Jesus. We're going to sing this together. It says, whom the sun sets free is free indeed. Whom the sun sets free is free indeed. We're just singing scripture. Sing that with me. Whom the sun sets free is free indeed. Come on, sing it out. Whom the sun sets free. song to us, so let's sing it out together.
Pray that you feel how close that God is to you this morning. He is there with you, no matter where you are. We were never meant to be captive except captivated by the love of God and captivated by him and who he is. I pray that you celebrate today that you are a child of God. Survive. 
on, let's sing that out together. Let's sing it out. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I Father, we thank you that we are your children. Sing over us this morning. Allow us just to be in your presence, to rest in your love. Thank you, Jesus. You are so good. I wish I had a church full of children that had come up here and gathered around me for this children's moment. But I don't, right? This is virtual worship. But you and your family, you still have an opportunity to worship with your children. In fact, we should form habits that every day lead us to worshiping together. Last week we talked about how we as a family, as parents and grandparents and caregivers, need to pay special attention to the anxieties that our children are facing. Well, this week I want to remind you that we understand the difficulties of these trying times for the caregivers, for parents, grandparents. We know these are very difficult times. So just know that you're in our prayers, and I encourage you to find ways to worship as a family. To help you with this, um, Tracy, our Director of Children's Ministry, has provided some resources you can find on the iofumc.org website. Just go to the IOF Kids area or the worship area. It's, you can find it on both. And you can download resources that you can use during the week. They'll, they go along with what, what we're preaching about today and what we're focusing on. And also help you as a family to stay connected during these difficult times. As we do each week, we continue in worship with the giving of our tithes and offering. But obviously we have to do that in a very different way. It's so important that we continue to practice the spiritual gift of generosity. And I know that can be very difficult if your family's facing financial struggles right now. But the church still is relying on the generosity of the church people, of our family. And to help us understand that a little more, um, our finance chair and a good friend of mine, known him for a long time, uh, Mr. Nat Cole, is going to come up here and talk to us a little bit about the importance of giving during this time. Uh, please allow me to introduce myself. Um, I'm Nat Cole. I'm a fellow member of this special church family. I'm blessed and privileged to serve as the chairperson of the finance committee. And in this role, have a stewardship responsibility in making certain that we have the financial resources to meet our basic mission, which is what I want to talk to you about for, for just a minute. Overall, our church has operated these past few years on a relatively solid financial foundation and until now have continued to do so. Unfortunately, however, recent financial results pretend a future that could compromise our ability to f fulfill our basic mission. Through the first two months of the year, income is down 17% due to a drop-off in tithes and offerings. 
This circumstance has been exacerbated by the coronavirus impacts. Significantly, the Child Development Center has been closed, and we don't know when it might reopen. This takes on special significance as the CDC provides a $100,000 annual tithe, over 20% to the church's operating budget. Bottom line, I'm asking the help of everyone to step up during these difficult times. I know that many in the congregation, just like the church, are feeling the pain of the coronavirus impacts on their own financial health. I, too, am personally feeling these impacts. But now is not the time to retreat from our obligations to financially support our wonderful church family. Giving is a spiritual discipline, a spiritual generosity, and we hope that we can all continue to find a way in these troubled times to support God's kingdom and this church and the ministries he's entrusted to us. So you'll see a picture, the blue button that says giving now. If you go to our website, iofumc.org, scroll down, find the button, and give generously. Thank you for joyfully giving back in response to all God has given you.
just feel like that maybe somebody may be waiting for um, their miracle. And I get that and I understand that. I know that there are so many of us in a place of need. But I feel like there's a verse um, that says, put me in remembrance of my word. And there are times that we can ask God for things, but I, I love that it says, come into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. And I just want to ask the question, not God, what are you going to do for me? But God, what have you already done? How have you proven yourself to me time and time and time again to be faithful and true and good and merciful even when I don't deserve it? So, Father, I do pray for the miracles that your people are praying for. But, Father God, first I thank you for the miracles that you've already done for the answered prayers that you've already answered, for the healings that have already taken place, no matter what it looks like. May we be a people that before we ask, that we are able to open our spiritual eyes and to see what you have already done for us. Thank you, Jesus, for that. Thank you, Jesus. I believe in you. I believe in you because you've always been faithful you've never let me down I believe in you I believe in you there's nothing else I can do because you're just that faithful sing I believe because I believe in you no fear no doubt I believe in you, you're the God, you're the God of me. I've seen it over and over again. Cause I believe in you, I believe in you, you're the God of me. Come on, sing it out one more time. Cause I believe in you. I believe in you. You're the God of miracles. Let's pray. Oh God, may this your holy word that we share this morning be written in our, on our hearts and lived out in our lives as we strive to be more and more like you, to love like you, and to understand what it means to be part of this wonderful world you've given us. So in these difficult times, let us receive something from this passage today that informs us and strengthens us for the task to come. We claim this with great anticipation of your working in through us as we are empowered by this word. Amen. Our scripture today is from John chapter 9, verse 1 through 12. And I'm going to skip a couple. And we'll pick it up at 18 and go through 41. It's a very long story. It's the encounter of Jesus and the blind beggar. Starting with verse 1 from chapter 9. As Jesus walked along, he saw a man who was blind from birth. Jesus' disciple asked, Rabbi, who sinned so that this man was born blind? The man or his parents? Jesus answered, neither he nor his parents. This happened so that God's mighty works might be displayed in him. While it's daytime, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. After he said this, he spit on the ground, made mud with the saliva, and smeared the mud on the man's eyes. Jesus said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam. This word meant sent. So the man went away and washed, and when he returned, he could see. 
The man's neighbors and those who used to see him when he was a beggar said, isn't this the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, it is. Others said, no, it's someone that looks like him. But the man said, yes, it's me. So they asked him, how are you now able to see? He answered, the man they called Jesus made mud, smeared it on my eyes and said, go to the pool of Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and then I could see. They asked, well, where is this man? He replied, I don't know. The Jewish leaders didn't believe the man had been blind and received his sight until they called for his parents. The Jewish leaders asked, is this your son? Are you saying he was born blind? How can he now see? His parents answered, we know he is our son. We know he was born blind. But we don't know how he now sees. And we don't know who healed his eyes. Ask him. He's old enough to speak for himself. See, his parents said this because they feared the Jewish authorities. This was because the Jewish authorities had already decided that whoever confessed Jesus to be the Christ would be expelled from the synagogue. That's why the parents said, he's old enough. Ask him. Therefore, they called a second time for the man who had been born blind and said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. The man answered, I don't know whether he's a sinner. Here's what I do know. I was blind and now I see. They questioned him. Well, what did he do to you? How did he heal your eyes? He replied, I already told you and you didn't listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? They insulted him. You are his disciple, but we are Moses' disciple. We know that God spoke to Moses, but we don't know where this man is from. The man answered, this is incredible. You don't know where he is from, yet he healed my eyes? We know that God doesn't listen to sinners. God listens to anyone who is devout and does God's will. No one has ever heard of a healing of the eyes of someone born blind. If this man wasn't from God, he couldn't do this. They responded, you were born completely in sin. How is it that you dared to teach us? And they expelled him. Jesus heard they had expelled the man born blind. Finding him, Jesus said, do you believe in the human one? He answered, well, who is he, sir? I want to believe in him. Jesus said, you have seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking to you. The man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped Jesus. Jesus said, I have come into the world to exercise judgment so that those who don't see can see. And those who see will become blind. Some Pharisees who were with him heard what he'd said and asked, well, surely we aren't blind, are we? Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you wouldn't have any sin. But now that you say we see, your sin remains. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's put this contact between Jesus and the blind man in context. In the last verse of the previous chapter, chapter 8, the ones John refers to as the Jewish opposition are ready to kill Jesus. It says in um, chapter 8, verse 58, I assure you, Jesus replied, before Abraham was, I am. So they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and left the temple. So Jesus blends into the crowd. He escapes them. And as Jesus and the disciples are fleeing 
those who wish him harm. They're making their way out of the temple, and they pass a man who had been blind from birth. Usually sits at the same spot, begging every day. The disciples ask Jesus a very odd question, at least odd to us. The disciples ask, Rabbi, who sinned so that this man was born blind? The man or his parents? It's from verse 2. When Jesus stops, think about that. In the middle of his getaway, with powerful people after him, with a goal of stoning him, he stops. Jesus answers the disciples' question as he speaks healing words into the man born blind. So this is more than a story about a miraculous physical healing. This is about personal and spiritual transformation. Today we might call that a converting experience. Or we might say that the man had a conversion. The man's need was not only his physical blindness, but also his spiritual. The story of the woman at the well that we shared last week was similar. This blind beggar needed acceptance, like the woman. He needed to know that someone cared. And Jesus filled that need. It's Jesus' desire to fill that need in all of us. When Jesus met that need for the blind man, it made a huge difference in his life. The man experienced a conversion from lost to found, from blindness to sight, from longing for a Messiah to experiencing the Messiah. So let's walk through some of the major impact that this encounter with Jesus had on the man's life. The first one deals with questioning. When we have an authentic, converting encounter with Jesus, it will raise questions about us. Others will notice that something is different, that there's a change. Let's look again at verses 8 and 9. Again, this is in chapter 9 of John, verses 8 and 9. It says, The man's neighbors and those who used to see him when he was a beggar said, Isn't this the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, It is. And others said, No, it's someone that looks like him. But the man said, Yes, it's me. The truth is that people walked past this man regularly. They had not stopped to notice. He was, for the most part, simply overlooked. He had become part of the generic scenery around the temple, an insignificant part of the background. The physical change in this blind beggar was actually very small. His eyes were once shut and are lifeless. But now, thanks to Jesus, they were open, and he could see his surroundings. For the first time, he did not just hear and feel and smell life. He saw it. They questioned if this was the same man because they barely remembered what he looked like in the first place. They did not recognize him now that he could see because they had not noticed him when he was blind. Well, they couldn't ignore him now. He was running around. He was looking at all the shapes and experiencing colors for the first time. He was talking to people. He was different. The people around him didn't understand that. So they started asking questions, making up excuses. A genuine conversion experience should lead us to change. When you and I become Christians, whether that point in our, our story happened long ago or whether it's still in the future, we become different people. We become changed in very important and noticeable ways. This transformation may mean that 
our decision-making changes. The words we use might change. Our thoughts change. Our habits change. And people will notice and likely have questions. Now, my story is that I claimed Jesus when I was very young. I think my confirmation class when I was around 12 was a turning point where I really listened to the preacher and thought about it and accepted my relationship with Christ as my own. But at some point after that, like many of us do, there was a season where it's not that I fell deeper into sin or didn't believe in God. I just became basically indifferent for many years. But then I, I got back to the church and God's Spirit, who never gave up on me, kept pulling me in. And, and I got back around the body of Christ, which is so important. I started dedicating my life more and more to study and prayer and meditation and fellowship and being present. The people around me noticed a change. At that point in my life, I was still in the Navy. And when I wasn't working, I was in the chief's mess. You may not know what that is. Not that important. But just know that it puts the salt in salty sailor, right? Which is much different than salty service. So... For example, what we might have a normal card game, you around the dinner table with your family. In that particular group, when we played cards, we would have creative names for some of these games, and names that to most of us now would seem inappropriate or vulgar. I didn't notice. The people I played with noticed that I no longer use those terms. They pointed out to me. When it was time to play music, I just naturally, I'd throw in a Christian CD for use young folks, CDs or something that we used to play music on. I didn't notice the change in me at the same pace as those around me. And it was a good change. An authentic relationship with God changes us. We make better choices. We strive more and more to please God and not others. Another change that people experience as Jesus heals is that we realize how much room we have to grow. Questions were left in the mind of the man who was born blind. They asked, where is this man? He replied, I don't know. Verse 12. The Pharisees criticized Jesus. Therefore, they called a second time for the man who had been born blind and said to him, Give glory to God. We know this man is a sinner. From verse 24, the man's response was that he didn't know whether Jesus was a sinner or not. Just because he met Jesus and was healed did not mean that this man magically had all the answers. The two most damaging mistakes that Christians make when witnessing about our faith to others are these. First, is to say that we know it all. That somehow now that we're Christian, we know better. We have all the answers you need. Just ask. That's neither biblical or even true. And it damages our witness to others. And the second is to say that since you became a Christian, all of your problems are gone. All is right with the world. All our problems are gone. Everything is rainbows, unicorns, and Mountain Dew. That's just simply not true. The man still didn't know why he was born blind. And Jesus did not offer him an answer to that question. Jesus only told him what he was going to do with this blindness so that God's mighty works might be displayed in him. Jesus would use this situation to glorify God. The man did not find out why Jesus picked him of all the people there on that particular Saturday afternoon. Many people needed healing. You do not have to know everything about the Bible and about Jesus in order to be a good witness. That's why it's called a spiritual journey. That's why we say things like we grow in Christ and we move together in our witness and in our faithfulness. 
see a genuine transformation in Christ. This is another change in the man. It results in a variety of responses from others. When the man was brought to the Pharisees and they questioned, even they were divided. Some said, this man, Jesus, can't be from God because he healed on the Sabbath. Others said, well, what do you mean? A man cannot do these things unless he's from God. The Pharisees came back to the man who was once blind and said, well, what do you say? He healed you, so you say. What do you think about it? Is he a prophet? Then they laughed in his face when the man claimed, yes, indeed, he is. It was clear that they did not believe that this man had ever been blind. You might run into people as a Christian that find it very hard to believe that you've made the changes that they see in your life. Well, you may say he's a Christian, but I knew him when, right? See, these are all responses of fear. There was another response of fear. His own parents were hesitant to get involved. The Pharisees called his parents. They didn't believe. It says in verse 18, the Jewish leaders didn't believe the man had been blind, been born blind, and received his sight until they called for his parents. 19 says the Jewish leaders asked, is this your son? Are you saying he was born blind? How can he now see? His parents answered, we know he's our son. We know he was born blind. But we do not know how he now sees. And we don't know who healed his eyes. I like this part. We'll ask him. He's old enough to speak for himself. And scripture makes it clear to us. Verse 22, it says, his parents said this because they feared the Jewish authorities. See, people fear what they do not understand. A genuine encounter with Jesus breeds relationship, which brings an understanding of who Jesus is, the Christ. This story begins with a physical healing of a person's eyesight. It ends with a transformation from spiritual darkness to an awakening. This man awoke when he washed that mud out of his eyes to see not only the light of the sun, he saw the light of the sun, Jesus Christ our Lord. Verses 35 through 41 tell us this story. After they expelled the man born blind, Jesus, finding him, said, Do you believe in the human one? He answered, Well, who is he, sir? I want to believe in him. Jesus said, You have seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. The man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped Jesus. I remember what it was like to live with limited spiritual sight. And I mourned the time that I wasted making excuses for why I did not like this church or didn't want to go to that church. I'm saddened to think of the times that I based decisions on what I thought the world had to offer me instead of what Christ paid dearly on my behalf. Yet more importantly... I celebrate this gift of spiritual healing. I remember, and I try to emulate every day, and I know you do too, right? We try to emulate who God is, who Jesus is for us, who he is in our lives. Because I look back, and I know that I've seen God with new eyes, and I know that God has done for me what he's done for this blind man. And many of you agree. And you know that God has done for you the same. And we can all say together that I once was blind, but now I see. Glory be to God, the one who heals us of our spiritual blindness and leads us to light. Amen.
O oh, great and loving God, thank you for living and loving in us and through us. May all that we do flow from our deep connection with you and with all beings everywhere. Help us become a community that vulnerably shares each other's burdens. Listen to our heart's longings for the healings of our world. Oh Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for those who are fearful that it is your presence that puts their fears at ease. May we see and feel and acknowledge you as our comforter and our help. We ask, Lord, that as we think of the things that are shaking us at this moment and in these days, that we also look to you and lean and trust that our fears may be put aside. Lord, we pray for those who are feeling lonely in these days, who feel isolated, or wondering when they will regain the opportunity to safely gather with those they love. May we acknowledge that we are never alone as long as we trust in you, that it is your presence, the presence of your Holy Spirit that reminds us that we are loved and worthy and sacred people. Lord, we pray for those who are fleeing the weight and responsibility of leadership on their shoulders for those who have difficult decisions to make in order to keep us safe and healthy. We know, Lord, that it's hard to make tough decisions, so we ask that it is through your wisdom and discernment that all of those entrusted with leadership lean. And we ask that you give us the assurance and the confidence to believe in them and trust and follow this guidance that we all may come through this safe and whole and well. Lord, we pray for all those who are experiencing new things in these times. Newness can be scary. We pray for those who have never had to homeschool children. Those who are not sure whether they're going to have a job when this is over. Or perhaps those who have never experienced the feeling of not knowing if they'll be able to feed their family. We pray, Lord, that perhaps you can answer these fears by, and these uncertainties by helping us come up with ways that we can be your hands and feet for one another. We find creative ways to be the church, to love as we are loved. Lord, we are grateful that we can call you God and Lord and Savior, but not everyone is so convinced. We know that it is in difficult times that people often have the most questions. So we ask a wonderful Holy Spirit that you are revealed to be the answer to all of these things. That if there's someone who has not been healed of their spiritual blindness, and if there's those that have been leaning on the world for way too long, let them now see that you are our light, that you shatter our darkness, you restore our sight, that you are the guide of our lives, and we claim that as a truth. So whether it's a reassurance for us, or whether there's someone hearing this prayer, participating in this worship service, that has not yet made that claim, 
hear our prayer now as we, we pray that we understand what it means to be loved. Forgive us, Lord. Hear our confessions. Heal us of our doubt. Give us that confidence of spirit and that peace that surpasses all understanding as we claim you as our God and our Lord, our Savior. Knowing that you are hearing us better than we are speaking, we offer these prayers in all of the holy names of you, our God. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Wherever you are, I hope that you um, were blessed by today, that God met you wherever you are. And since today we um, talked about our eyes being opened, our spiritual eyes, just to be able to see God and his goodness to be transformed in his image and his likeness. Let's just sing Amazing Grace. Amazing.